So, um, yes, I am a social scientist, um, and I, I love coming to conferences like this. Um, any old day I can walk down the hall and talk to another social scientist, but here I get to talk to a bunch of geneticists, and um, I moonlight as a gen geneticist and a behavior geneticist in some of the work that I've done looking at the genetic behavior of political, um, uh, the genetic uh, outcomes of, for political behavior, and also looking at the genetic basis of social behavior. And today what I want to talk about is how these things might be connected to our evolution as a species. If it's the case that we form these networks in a way that's consistent over time, and if it's the case that these networks have an impact on fitness, it is possible that the way this has <coughs> played out over hundreds of thousands of years is that we form networks that are adaptive to our environments. Those environments include other people. So that's mainly sort of the, the, the big idea that I want to focus on today in reviewing some of the work that led to the work that we're doing here. But before I do that, I want to make sure that we understand what the links are. We spend a lot of time talking about protein-protein interactions and go tables and annotations. Um, what we're talking about today is we're talking about friends. And I'll just remind you what a friend is. Um, each of you should make your own list of what people you would consider a friend. So answer for yourself these two questions. Who do you discuss important matters with? Okay? You have to do this. There's going to be a quiz okay, in, in your mind. First name, last name of every person you discuss important matters with. And then who, who do you discuss, your, who do you spend your free time with? Okay, and those two things might not be the same. You might have important work colleagues that you don't really see after work. You might have people that you go to the game with that you really don't discuss important things with, but you might consider both of those people close. Okay, so everyone's got their list. Raise your hand really high if you named 100 people. Okay, no, no one named 100? So what the hell is going on with Facebook? <laughs> the average person today on Facebook has 150 friends. Okay, so the very first thing I want to do is I want to emphasize I'm not talking about that kind of friend. It's so funny, in 10 years, we had to completely redefine uh, what these things mean. We had to, we have, I had to start from first principles with this definition because um, what's happening on the line has completely changed. But I'm talking about your deep, close social relationships, the people that you pay attention to every day. Now, if I were to map your networks in this room, there would be a lot of interconnectivity. Do you think the network would look like this? No, networks, we've seen a gazillion networks today, and we're going to see more and more. We all study them. Networks have a consistent structure. Okay? And, and these are a number of different human um, networks. So networks of uh, people in a college dorm, networks of high school students, networks of uh, <laughs> collaborators, um, a telephone network. And, you know, as a network theorist, you might see subtle differences in here that you'd be interested in the differences. But those things all look a lot more similar to one another than they do to that lattice. So the question is, why do we form networks of this structure? And what is it about human networks that might make us different from other kinds of networks that we observe in nature, say protein uh, interaction networks, for example? Well, one of the things that we need to do in order to be able to understand this question is try to break down and think about, well, what kinds of things can we measure in a network that might have some implication for fitness? <coughs> okay, so for example, degree. Okay, so you guys all have your lists. So you're going to be able to count the number of people on your list, and that's your degree. And we can imagine that the number of people on your list is going to be important. People who have more people on their lists have more opportunities to get support, for example. And so that might make them more fit. Or that's more people that you need to support, which might make you less fit. But either way, it has implications. We don't have 150 friends, and there's probably a reason for that. It's because people who have 150 friends are not as fit as people who have somewhere between zero and eight, which is the number that we get when we do Gallup surveys all across the United States. We ask them to give us their lists. Ask the number of people we get. Out of 2,000 people, is eight people. Okay, so, so one of these things that we need to think about is just the simplest measure of a network, which is the degree. Another thing we need to think about is the people that you can't see, and that's your friends of friends, and your friends of friends of friends, because those are going to determine how central you are on the network. Okay, so for example, um, it, you, you might have the same number of friends if you're person C or person D, but person C has many more friends of friends and friends of friends of friends, and so they're more central in this network. And to give you an example of why this is so important, let me put you in a counterfactual space. Suppose that the Black Plague is rolling through Europe, 
Would you rather be the life of the party or a hermit? Okay, you'd rather be a hermit, right? So this, this person is, is going to be more susceptible to disease. And to the extent that disease has shaped our evolutionary history, that's going to be one mechanism whereby these networks might be playing a role in our evolution as human beings, these friendship networks. Um, and so this is another reason why you, know, you can imagine that, that fitness might be playing a role in, in our evolution. There's another measure, transitivity, which may be important. Now, transitivity is this property where, two, the, um, where the probability that two of your friends are friends with one another. Okay, and, and you can imagine, for example, that you have two people, A and B, who have the same number of friends, but if you count up the number of their friends who are, are friends with one another, they have a very different kind of life. Person B is connected to individuals who don't know each other. They're, they're connected to people who are in, in much different groups. And person A is connected to people who are all connected to one another in this really dense, densely connected uh, group. And so just to give you an example of how this might affect fitness, I have a nice clip from Seinfeld to explain why it's the case that you might not want to live in a densely connected network. Is this going to work? Is it? Should, I, should I just do that? OK, try it again. No, why? She called Susan last night. Oh, yeah, I know. How do you know? That was my idea. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. What'd you do that for? She was looking for someone to go to the show with. Well, that was really a stupid thing. <laughs> you know what's going to happen now? Worlds collide. What? Well, yeah. <laughs> because this world is your sanctuary, and if that world comes in contact... Yes, it blows up. <laughs> so, you know that? What did you tell Elaine for? I didn't know. Kramer told me about the worlds. You couldn't figure out the world's theory for yourself? <laughs> it's just common sense. Anybody knows you got to keep your worlds apart. Okay, so I'll leave it up to you to decide who's more fit, Jerry Seinfeld or George Costanza. But you can imagine, for example, that there are information processes in, in networks that are going to be relevant for transitivity. Okay, so if you're trying to find the mastodon and you don't know where it is, do you want to be in a densely connected group, or do you want to be uh, the person that's connected to this group, that group, and that group? If you want more information, it's better to have very low transitivity groups. If you want a lot of social support, if you want to get a group of people who are going to watch your back when you're actually hunting the mastodon, then you're probably going to want a set of relationships that are all very highly interconnected. This is the way we form these relationships in the military, even today. We get a bunch of guys who all know each other and all know that they all know each other. These highly dense groups give you a different set of advantages than these very, very sparse groups, and you can imagine that fitness is going to affect those things differently as well. So basically, I'm just trying to convince you that, that, that these social networks could have played a role in our, um, in our uh, selection as a species. Now, um, I've come to think about this question because of an original set of studies that we did in the Framingham um, heart study. And I was very glad to hear Atul talk about uh, this study. It's actually 60 years old, not 30 years old. Um, and they started back um, in the late 1940s in the small town outside of Massachusetts, um, asking people to come in and do surveys every two to four years, get seen by a doctor. It's just a fantastic study. Not only did we learn um, what cholesterol was from the study, we also, it was the first study to show our relationship between smoking and cardiac disease, for example. And so we actually got really lucky because when we started talking to them about adding a social network uh, uh, instrument to their data, we discovered that in their administrative records, they had already been keeping social network data since the early 1970s. And so all we had to do was just turn that administrative data into you know, electronic data so that we could study it. And it took us two years to do it, but we went through it record by record by record. And now we have these beautiful maps, these beautiful maps of thousands of people with this really good <coughs> diagnostic data and genetic data, as it turns out. The very first thing that we did with that is, is a paper on obesity. We wanted to know whether or not the obesity ep ep epidemic was literally an epidemic. Not in the sense that it's endemic, but in the se sense that, that obesity might spread from person to person to person. And what I mean by that is not that fat flies off me and sticks to you. <laughs> what I mean is that I start jogging, and so, so you start jogging. Or I eat a lot, and you eat a lot. Or 
I start jogging, I lose weight, you say, hey, you look pretty good. Maybe I shouldn't eat so much. And so there's a lot of different complex pathways where these social behavior copying processes and these, these, these um, emulations of social norms can spread through, through the network from person to person to person. And underlying obesity is these behaviors. These behaviors have an impact on whether or not you're overweight. Um, and so we drew a map. We um, made the node size proportional to body mass index. So larger nodes are literally larger people. <laughs> we, we colored the nodes uh, that were obese so that we could start to look for clusters. And the very first thing that we were able to characterize statistically is that they, these clusters are really strong. It doesn't surprise me that label, um, this label propagation method works. I'm sure it would work for, for BMI as well. Um, and um, so what we found in particular in Framingham is that if I don't know anything about you, but I know that your friend is obese, then I know that you have a risk of obesity that's 40% higher than if that friend is not obese. If your friend's friend is obese, it increases your risk of obesity by about 20%. If your friend's friend's friend is obese, it increases your risk by about 10%. And beyond these three degrees of separation, maybe this is related to this three degrees of this label propagation thing, we didn't find any differences. So the, 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 it didn't matter whether or not the, the fourth degree friend was obese or not, it had, it had no correlation with your particular outcome. So we were really excited. We thought, okay, this is great. This is, this is the evidence that we're looking for. Unfortunately, it's, it's not that easy, right? Because one possibility is that there's random chance. You have to be able to characterize whether or not what you see is different from chance because it could be that two people who are obese just happen to be friends with one another. Or we can do that pretty easily with, with network permutation methods. We can take care of that problem. Another problem we have a much harder time with, though, is homophily. This is a word that means love of like. Um, it's this idea that that bird didn't make the other bird look that way. They, they sat down next to each other because they are the similar type. And to the extent that I am becoming friends with people who have the same body weight as me, or I'm becoming friends with, with people who have the same behaviors that underlie that body weight, that might be driving these clusters that we see in, in, these, in these networks. Um, and so we would need some way to be able to tease apart how much it was one thing versus the other. And our problems don't stop there, because you also have differences in context. And so it could be that you and your friend both live in a neighborhood where McDonald's opens up down the street, and you both start chugging Big Macs, not knowing the other one was doing it. And so your weight will go up together because of the shock to the environment that affects both of you. It has nothing to do with your friendship, but it's correlated with the probability that you're friends, because we tend to make friends with people who are, in, are, in, are closer to us. And not everyone. If you think about your list, there are probably two or three people on your list who are hundreds of miles away. But in general, you know, the curve is that the closer they are, the more likely they are your friend. And so this is another problem with these studies. And if you could figure out a way to deal with these problems, then you'd be able to get at this, which is, is trying to estimate how much one person is influencing another and is influencing another. And so we tried to do this by using dynamic information. And this is actually a movie of the network of how it changes over 32 years. And what you'll see is you'll see two circles coming together. There's a line forms between them. Two people become friends. They get married. Or sometimes you teach two circles fly apart. Maybe that's someone getting divorced. Um, but one of the things that you should be seeing is starting in, the, in about the 1980s, but about now, is that the circles are starting to get larger and larger and larger. <laughs> Consistent with what was going on with the rest of the country, people in Framingham were having an epidemic of obesity. And the thing that we can use in this dynamic data is we can control for what you were like when you became friends with somebody and see net of that whether or not there's a change, whether or not a, ch a change in your friend actually induced a change in you. And so we developed statistical models to do this. We tested them with Monte Carlo simulations to show that, that this is a good way for you to distinguish between homophily and influence with one caveat. And that is, this method can control for you choosing a friend who is obese like you, it cannot control for indirect sources of homophily. And there's been this huge sort of debate now and um, efforts to try to improve these methods from observational studies. But ultimately, you're going to have a problem here, just like in any other observational study, which is an omitted uh, uh, variable bias problem. If you're not controlling for absolutely everything that's a source of friendship, it could be that, that you're going to be confounding um, homophily and, and influence effects. Um, but we found another way that we can use this network information to, to get a little bit more leverage on causality. Okay, so suppose that, that uh, I name Nicholas as a friend, but he doesn't name me back. Okay, that's very sad for me, but I have to tell you, think about your lists. I'm very sad to tell you this, but, but there's not really high correspondence between your list and your friend's lists. 
Okay, so probably about 50% of the people that you named, if I had them do this same exercise, they would forget to name you. And that's probably the sign of, of, on average, of an asymmetric relationship, where you feel more a friend with that person than they feel with you. Well, as a researcher, that's great for me, because now what we should see is that Nicholas should affect me more than I affect him. And if that's the case, then that's some evidence that, that there's this directional effect of, of uh, changes in the network flowing from person to person. And then the people who name each other, those are going to be the friends that have the strongest ties, the ones uh, that are the, the strongest relationships, and we expect those to be the ones that, that pop the most. And so we actually looked at the, these different kinds of relationships. And so this ego perceived friend, that's the effect of the person I named on me. And when they become obese, it increases my risk of obesity, net of controls, in the next two to four years by 57%. Um, now, the effect of me becoming obese on them, if they didn't name me back, not different from zero. Now, those two um, confidence intervals overlap. And so we've, we've taken some flack for, for pointing this out. We never said the difference was significant. We would like larger sample sizes to see whether or not those narrow, whether or not you actually get a significant, the significant difference, because then you will have, I think, some pretty cool proof, proof information that just like you can use time to improve inferences about causality, you can use network direction to improve inferences about network uh, about causality. Um, but look at the mutuals. So if you name someone and they name you back, that person becomes obese, it triples your risk of obesity. So tie strength is probably playing a role here as well. We see this over and over and over again. Strong ties are critical for the spread of behavior. Now, immediate neighbors, we had a bunch of next door neighbors because it start, the site started in Birmingham and people moved, but there were still a lot of people who lived next door to each other. When your next door neighbor becomes obese, there's no relationship whatsoever to your own weight status. Okay? So this is not context. This is not McDonald's opening up down the street. Okay? So again, all the caveats apply. This is an observational study. The estimates are biased. There is indirect homophily that probably influences these, but there have been follow-up studies to do sensitivity analyses to suggest that this finding is actually going to be robust whenever we start doing experimental studies. Now, we repeat the same procedure for smoking behavior. Smoking behavior, again, if I don't know anything about you, but any of your friend's friend's friend smokes, I can do better than chance of predicting whether or not you'll, you'll smoke. Same thing with drinking behavior. So if your friend's friend's friend drinks heavily, you're more likely to drink heavily. Same thing with happiness. If your friend's friend's friend is happy, you're more likely to be happy. Same thing with depression. If your friend's friend's, I'm sorry, loneliness. Friend's friend's friend is lonely, you're more likely to be lonely. Same thing with depression. If your friend's friend's friend is depressed, you are more likely to be depressed. Are you getting bored yet? Okay, so, so people are saying, okay, okay, we get it, we get it. Um, maybe there's something weird about these Framingham people. Maybe, maybe they're just like a close group and it's not representative and we shouldn't be paying attention to this. So then we started looking at the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, which is Health, Health which is a study of 90,000 adolescents, um, cluster, cluster randomized sample of high schools from all around the, around the country. Um, and you know, our critics were absolutely right. Um, we don't find the same kind of relationships in this study. Um, marijuana smoking um, and also sleep behavior, they do not extend out to three degrees. They extend out to four degrees. So if I don't know anything about you, but I know that, that your teenager and your friend's 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 friend smokes marijuana, I can do better than a chance of predicting whether or not you smoke marijuana. The same thing with sleep behavior. If that person doesn't sleep well, you also don't sleep well. In this particular paper, we're looking to see the relationship between these two things and see whether or not you could use network information to try to get at how these two things are related to one another. And since then, there have been a number of replications in other data sets. So it's not something weird about Framingham. We see these, these effects on people that we can't see. It's not just the people on your lists, it's the people on their lists, and potentially also the people on their lists. Now we've started to do experimental studies in, in response to some of the criticisms of the observational studies, and so this is an experimental study where we, we had people play this generosity game in the laboratory, a public goods game. We bring in people, I've been playing a group of four, and I, the researcher, give each of them $10, and say, you can, you can keep all this money, or you can give as much of it as you want away to a group project. Every dollar you give, I'm going to multiply by 1.4 and redistribute the money. Now, if you think about that for a minute, what that means is that every dollar you give, you're only going to get 40 cents back. And so if you're selfish, what you hope is that um, you're with a bunch of people who are going to give everything they, they possibly can to the group, but you can keep everything for yourself because that's how you maximize your income. And so when economists have studied this game before, they, they, they've 
the study, you know, there's different ways that you can manipulate the outcome of this game. What we wanted to know is whether or not seeing how someone else played, who you were randomly assigned to play with, affected you in the next round. And it did. And in fact, if you think about this, this is a network, because what they did is they reassigned each one of these players to play with a different group every time. So A played in a group with B, C, and D, and they went and played in a group with E, F, and G, and so on. And what we were able to show is that if you give an extra dollar in the first round, then everybody that you play with in the next round, when they're playing with completely different people, they give an extra 20 cents. And the people they play with give an extra 8 cents. And the people they play with give an extra 5 cents. And I know 5 cents doesn't sound like much, but don't forget you're getting this exponential property of the network that is increasing every stage. You go from 3 to 9 to 27 and so on. And when you add up all of the effects of that one extra dollar of giving, you find that the network gives an extra three dollars. In other words, the network acts like a matching grant. And this is why I think it's, it's not only the case that there's some credible ideas for how um, you know, our fitness might be really affected by our behavior in these networks, but it's, it's not just the case that, that it's a one-to-one -one relationship. We're doing things that are bouncing out to other people and potentially bouncing back to us. In fact, this is an active area of research. We're interested in studying karma in, in networks, but that's a different topic. Um, so, it's interesting that I always have to sort of start the talk by asking people if they have 100 friends because this is what we think about today. We think about this revolution in computational social science where we're getting all the social network data um, from online sources. And you can get them from Facebook, you can get them from Twitter, you can get them from LinkedIn, you can also make inferences. Does anybody know um, what this is? This is the political blogs here in the United States. And the links here are the, the actual hyperlinks from one blog to the other. Uh, the blue are the liberals and the red are the conservatives. So you can see there's a lot of discourse between them online. Um, and so, so um, what, what we want to know is, is what's going on in these online networks. Is it something different than what we see in these real world networks um, that we've already studied in these other contexts? Um, and so we're going to ask this person to tell us a little bit about social media. Does anybody know who this person is? Well, shout it out if you know who she is. Alyssa Milano, that's right. So you might know her from Who's the Boss? Um, or uh, well, just Who's the Boss? Um, so she's a television actress. The reason why I'm talking about Alyssa Milano is because she loves to tweet, and tweeters love her. At the time I took the snapshot, she had over a million followers on Twitter. Today she has over two and a half million. Well, the reason why I took this snapshot on this particular day is because a miraculous thing happened. She actually tweeted a link to our book on social networks. Not only that, she tweeted a link to the Amazon webpage. So all her followers had to do, her one million followers had to do, is click on that, click on buy instantly, and I wouldn't be here today. I'd be on some <laughs> island. <laughs> you would think also that as much as I believe in the power of, of these social networks, I might think that this is what's going to happen. But don't forget, what happened to the next door neighbors? Nothing. And so one interesting Alternate hypothesis is that nothing will happen whenever she tweets a link to her book. Well, fortunately, we can go to the data. This is my book sales over the course of the month where she tweeted, and see if you can guess where she tweeted. She tweeted right there. <laughs> okay, so that's why I sell my day job. This is now science, okay? But this anecdote supports what we have seen in our scientific studies. Um, where we do things and we compare, for example, a real-world network, in this case, which is going to look like the network I would draw if I was constructing a network here, um, and to this Facebook network, where you have so much connectivity that really what's happening is you're connecting people who aren't really friends. You're connecting people who in real life would be friends of friends or friends of friends of friends. And whenever we try to find correlations in that Facebook network, we find nothing. We looked at so many different things, we can't find it. There are too many times. So what do you have to do? You have to find the real-world friends on Facebook. And how do you do that? Well, what you can do is you can use photo tags, for example. And here what we have is, is a network of photo tag relationships. If I tag you in a photo, um, and now we get the number down from an average of 150 to an average of, of 10. Um, and here we start to see correlations. You can see that we color the circles according to whether or not people were smiling in their profile picture or not smiling in their profile picture. <laughs> and here we find that these clusters extend out to two Separation. We've also done this for a, an outcome that actually matters. We look, use the, the photos to estimate people's body mass index. Um, and here we found clusters of over, overweight women and clusters of overweight men that extend out to two degrees of separation as well. And that's just with the photo tags. 
when we use more information than just the photo tags, we actually get, get better resolution. And my prediction is that we'll actually get these three degrees results um, that we're, we're finding in, in these real-world social networks as well. Um, now, is, this was all prelude to actually working directly with Facebook to start to do some experiments. It's the same transition online that we did in real life, going from the observational studies to the experimental studies. In the 2010 election, um, we actually put a message at the top of the Facebook news feed um, on election day that was trying to get people to go and vote. And the fortunate thing is that, that not everyone saw it. Okay, so we randomly assigned who would see it and who didn't. So if you logged in to Facebook on election day in 2010 and you're a U.S. citizen, you were in our experiment. 61 million people. I think it's to date the largest social science experiment ever conducted, but I'm sure it will be eclipsed within the next year. This is the new era that we are in. We're going to be doing these large-scale randomized experiments and all kinds of different things. And what we found in this case was that you had a direct effect. The message had a direct effect on people who actually voted because of those 61 million people, we actually went with 6 million of them in 13 states to voter registration records to see whether or not they actually showed up at the polls. And what we found was that the people who saw the message actually were more likely to go to the polls in real life than the people who didn't see the message. A single message on Facebook, one message got 60,000 extra people to vote in 2010. Now that would be interesting enough for me, except that that's not why I did the experiment. I did the experiment because on Facebook, you can look not just to see what happened to the people who saw the message, you can look to see what happened to the friends of the people who saw the message. And the friends of the people who saw the message were more likely to vote than the friends of the people who didn't see the message. And that got an extra 280,000 people to the polls. So total 320,000 extra people, a single message on election day, um, changed their behavior as a consequence of what was going on online. Now, our reviewer at Science said he didn't understand why he was reviewing the paper on Farm Bill. <laughs> but I think that we are in a new era now where reviewers are going to start to take this more seriously. What's going on online has an effect on the real world. And you're going to see more papers like this that make this point explicit. Um, not only that, but we also were able to separate out the close friends from the, from the regular friends. We did a separate study where we asked people to give us their lists, like I talked to you guys about your lists. And we also took their Facebook information. And we uh, build a, a classifier to try and figure out which of those friends are their real world friends. Now, we can get up to 90% accuracy predicting who your best friend in real life is on Facebook. But with a very simple algorithm without any weights at all, all you have to do is just count up the number of times you've had any interaction whatsoever, a photo tag, a comment, a like, um, uh, uh, any kind of interaction whatsoever on Facebook. You just count those up, you get 85% accuracy for picking who the best friend is. So you use that machine learning learning algorithm to separate out those that average 150 friends between your 10 closest friends and everybody else. And guess where all the action was? It was all in your 10 closest friends. They accounted for every single one of the extra votes that, that we reported. And so, yes, it's true. Facebook friends don't matter. It's the real friends that matter. And the reason why Facebook is so important is because it's a repository of these real world connections, which are going to be important if we want to understand how these real world behaviors are happening online and offline. And so we, we get all of these different contexts in which we show an observational and experimentally that we have these effects that spread from person to person to person. Um, and we started to think about, well, where did these come from? And this is what got us into thinking about genetics and, and about natural selection. Um, one of the, the, uh, the things that we noticed is that this three degrees rule might be a result of natural human group size. The average person has about five social contacts, which means <coughs> that, you know, roughly speaking, they have about 25 friends of friends. They have about 125 friends of friends of friends. Well, it turns out there's a number called Dunbar, Dunbar's number, which is 150, which is inferred as natural human group size by comparing the frontal cortex of a number of um, non-human primates um, to the, um, the natural, natural group size of those different species. And you can see the line. It's actually a pretty nice straight line in this log lock plot. And you can just extrapolate and say, well, where would Homo sapiens fall on this line if we knew what, what the number was and it was 150? And Robin Dunbar has done a number of creative other kinds of measures to try to, to get at this number. But, but maybe there's something about our brains, about the number of people that we can actually be connected with. And maybe it's not a coincidence that on Facebook right now, the average number of friends people have is about 150. Robin Dunbar makes a big deal of this um, in his new book. We also noticed that a lot of the things that we were looking at not only had um, tremendous you know, effects from these, this, these social networks. So it's not always the case that social networks have a big impact on these outcomes, but there also um, was a, a good bit of literature that genes influence these outcomes. And so we know that, that um, obesity has a genetic component. Um, we know that smoking has a genetic component. Um, we, um, 
um, know that happiness uh, it has a genetic component. About 50% of stable happiness can be explained by differences in genes. Um, cooperation, just like our cooperation experiment, um, we did an ex uh, experiment with twins and we were able to show that you get more cooperation similarity between identical twins and fraternal twins. Um, and so it, it gives us this idea that you have social networks that are affecting these outcomes, you have genes that are affecting these outcomes, maybe there's this connection here. Maybe one of the things that we're seeing that we haven't studied yet in this uh, overall explanation is that genes actually influence social networks which then in turn affect these outcomes. And then the whole thing over the course of evolution may feed back so that you, you develop a social network of a certain structure, you have a certain personality that causes you to, to form a social network of a certain shape, it affects your behaviors, and then you live or you die, you reproduce or you don't. And you get this process where you can feed back and actually see social networks as a consequence of this process of, of natural selection, perhaps. Um, so one of the very first things we wanted to know is, well, how old are our network structures? And so we went to a group in um, Tanzania called the Hadza, which are still hunter-gatherers today, the one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer groups on the planet. Um, if you wanted to know what your ancestors lived like 100,000 years ago, this is probably the, the best modern day way to do it. There are a lot of objections to whether or not these people actually live the way we lived 100,000 years ago. They've been exposed to pastoralists, for example, and that exposure probably has changed how they live. They've been exposed to at least one postdoc at this point, we know. And so, so these things, you know, we have to worry about whether or not they're actually representative, but it's probably the best we can do. And what we did is we actually took a photographic census that one of our co-authors had created and had them name their friends. After this camp ends, with whom would you like to camp? Um, and they, we recorded their answers, it sort of made a Stone Age Facebook, and we actually studied their behavior. Um, we had them play these cooperation games again. And one of the things that we discovered is that people who were cooperative in these groups tended to be connected to other people who were cooperative. Um, and this is very, very similar to the result that we got experimentally with, uh, with the U.S. students, where if I see you cooperate, I copy your cooperation, it goes on. But in this case, because it's observational, we don't know, it could be that, that you're actually just choosing friends who are like you rather than influencing them to be like you. But either way, it doesn't matter. Because one of the things that we know from um, evolutionary um, theory is that it's easier for altruism to evolve if you have higher between group um, variation and lower within group variation. And the reason why is because the lower your in group variation is, the more the group is going to protect altruists that give that group an advantage relative to other groups. This is the first time that this has ever been documented. It's been speculated for over, over 100 years that this might be one of the reasons why we've evolved altruism as a species, but this is the first time anyone has ever, ever measured it. The other thing that we found is that you have these, these degrees of separation. Here we found that, that these cooperative clusters, they extend out to two degrees of separation. You can see our confidence intervals were quite wide, but we might have actually gotten out to three degrees of separation if we had about double the, the, the sample size. But even more strikingly, the structure of these networks on a variety of different dimensions, they look exactly <coughs> like the networks that we, stu that we studied today. In, in these modernized networks, you look at the degree distribution, you look at reciprocity, um, you look at, um, we, we looked at about 10 different features of, of these, these social networks. Um, degree degree correlation, it's all there. If, if you, for all practical purposes, if I gave you this network and another network from the Ad Health study, I think even as network theorists, you might have a hard time figuring out which came from the Hadza group and which came from the Ad Health group. And that's very striking, because what that suggests is that if natural selection has acted on a social network, it did so prior to the advent of, of hunting and, and gathering. And this is one of the reasons why we're starting to look at genes, because one of the things we want to figure out is, well, maybe there's something that's happening prior to, to that advent in our history that, that could help us to understand whether or not there was a, a, a role to be played by genes. The first study that we did on, the, the, on genes was a twin study. This is where we always start, and I know that you know, those of you um, who are uh, familiar with, with twin studies will know that like, the, one of the, 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 the laws of, of, of twin studies is that everything is heritable, right? So, um, that's uh, one of the things that um, make people a little bit skeptical about these studies. But one of the nice things about the molecular revolution is that a lot of the early results from twin studies have now been validated by uh, molecular uh, methods. So, for example, Peter Vischer has this wonderful set of papers where he uses um, exact uh, relatedness between siblings, not twins, just between any order of siblings, and uses that relatedness then as variation to, to measure against similarity in height between those siblings and gets an estimate of heritability of height of about 0.8, which is exactly what all, all of the twin studies got earlier on. 
Um, so we did a twin study of, um, of social networks. We compared the social networks of identical twins to the social network of recovered twins and health study. And we found that um, the estimates of heritability for end degree were about 45%. Centrality, about 33%, which makes sense if in-degree is, is heritable. And, and if you think about it, it's, it's sort of reasonable that you would get these kinds of results, even sort of at a top-level um, way of thinking about it. Um, some people are more attractive than others, morphologically. Um, some people are more extroverted than others. And I think people recognize that these traits have a genetic basis, and that would have an impact on, on you know, what, what kind of social <coughs> networks you would have. The thing that I thought was just miraculous in this study was that we found that transitivity was heritable. And we actually did some modeling to try to figure out what could have caused that heritability. And the only thing that we could come up with that caused that heritability is, is the, the, um, the introduction by you of two of your friends. So what this means is that this result suggests that genes have an impact not just on you, but on whether or not two of your friends are friends with one another. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. Your genes affect whether or not two other people are friends. If natural selection is acting on these friendship networks, it's not doing so necessarily only at the individual level. Because you, if you're living in these groups of people, whether or not two of your friends are friends with one another has an impact on some of these things I talked about before, about whether or not you'll survive. And so forget about the, you know, the debates about group selection versus individual selection. We need to be thinking about network selection. Because there are, this is you know, evidence that something is going on at that level that may have, have uh, been uh, involved in our evolutionary history. Um, as a follow-up to this study, we started looking um, at candidate genes, and one of the questions that we wanted to ask here was whether or not we tend to have similar genes to people that we're friends with. Net of uh, controls for ancestry to wipe out uh, uh, population trafficking. In this case, we found two candidate genes out of the 10 that we looked at. Um, one that exhibited um, significant heterophily, both in the ad health data and in the uh, uh, replication in the premium heart study. But we also found an evidence of homophily, this DRD2 gene. Um, the only thing that's really been associated with um, that sort of makes sense is um, alcoholism. And so one possibility is that you meet people in the bar, right? So you guys both go to the bar and you meet, and as a consequence, you are now friends with someone who is genetically similar to you. But think about the implication for this. One is, if that's true and there's spillovers with these behaviors, then we're doing all the behavior genetics wrong. Because we're assuming that, that all the individuals are independent. You know, we spent all this time working on um, how to deal with family structure. We don't spend any time thinking about friendship structure. So methodologically, I think it's an interesting question to what extent this would alter the estimates that we're getting from some of these behavior genetic studies. But the other thing is, is that not only is it the case that your own genes might predispose you to an activity, but you and I are going to be surrounded by other people who are also predisposed to that same activity. Which means that changing that behavior via the environment may be more difficult or more complicated than we previously thought. Um, now, this was just a Canada gene study, and I know that Canada gene studies have, have come under a lot of attack recently. And so our, our newest um, effort is to really try and do a genome-wide study and to better understand um, what that's telling us. And so this is hot off the presses. I've been busy working on this all day. Um, um, and actually, what, we're, what we've done is we've done um, a genome-wide scan where what we do is we correlate my genotype with my friend's uh, genotype. And this is for about 1,500 pairs in the Premium Heart Study. Um, these are people that were named as, as friends. And um, we've had some, uh, one of the interesting things that we've had difficulty um, dealing with is that when you have minor allele frequency problems in your dependent variable in, 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 in most other studies, uh, it doesn't affect the independent variable. But here it does. If you have a minor low frequency of 1% in your dependent variable, you're also going to have an independent variable that you care about. So what this means now is that we actually need a pretty high threshold for minor low frequency to sort of kick out results that we're, we're not comfortable with what those standard errors are. So it appears that if we restrict the analysis to just common variants, to variants that have a minor low frequency greater than 0.1, for example, um, then we get a nice you know, flat QQ plot and, and all the statistics kind of work out that suggest that what we've done to control for population stratification work and so on. But you'll see that after all that, we really don't get any um, significant sense, which is not that necessarily a big deal because that's not the reason why we're doing the study. We're doing the study because we're interested in seeing whether or not there is selection pressure on these particular genes that are more likely to be correlated between different individuals. And this comes out of theoretical work that we've done with Martin Nowak, where we actually did an evolutionary model to see what kinds of homophily would, would exist in equilibrium. 
And so um, this is a really simple model. What you do is, is you say, okay, we're going to have sort of some kind of matching process in a population, and you're going to come together with somebody, and you're deciding whether or not to engage in an interaction with that person. Um, that person is either going to be of a similar type to you or a different type to you. Um, and those, you can have M types. You can have as many different types as you want, and there's only going to be one to them for an interaction. And what happens is you are going to get one payoff if that person is similar to you and a different payoff if they are different from you. So one payoff to homophily, one payoff to heteropoly. And then we just use um, the evolutionary game theory to um, uh, derive an equilibrium model that helps us to figure out under what conditions are you going to get people that want to hang out, to interact with people who are like them. And it won't surprise you that when you increase the payoff to heteropoly, you get more people who are at heteropolis. You, when you increase the payoff to homophily, you get more people who are homophilus. But the truly interesting thing here is the payoff to homophily can be much, much lower than the payoff to heteropoly, and people will still prefer to hang out with people who are like them. And the reason why is because of the coevolution with the type and the trait of seeking out people like yourself. So if there's more people in your environment who are like you, it's easier to find them. So you don't need as much of a fitness advantage whenever you interact with them in order for it to be beneficial to you in the long run. And so one prediction here is that uh, from this, this model is that all of those different measures, those different types in the, in the genome that are more strongly selected for uh, uh, if you use sort of whatever measure of selection you want to use, um, those are also going to be exhibiting greater homophily. So if you, if you think about that plot that I just showed you, that, that uh, Manhattan plot, those are t-values from these different tests, what we expect is that as those t-values increase, we're going to have a stronger signature of positive selection at the, at the um, genetic level. Um, and that's what we find. Okay, so here we, on genotypic correlation, this is the t-value for each one of those SNPs. Um, and this measure of positive selection is part of Sabeti's um, uh, CMS score. It's, uh, What's the stand for? It's the um, composite of multiple signal score. Um, and what you can see is, is that for these SNPs that exhibit the most positive correlation, these are the, the SNPs that are most likely to be ones where you and your friend have the same genotype, um, we get to see a significantly um, enriched set of SNPs that exhibit positive selection in this case. So what this means is, is the, the genetic trait that you share in common with your friend are those that have been under most recent rapid natural selection over the last few hundred thousand years. That's as far as I've got. Um, so I, um, I'd love to hear your comments in the Q&A about sort of what you think about this and what directions you, you think we should go. The next step that we want to do is we want to do a Go analysis, although I've heard a lot of bashing of Go at the conference, so I don't know whether or not we should be using these numbers methods or whatever, but, but we don't have a significant SNP to say, ah, oh, you know, here's, here's a gene that we can look into, and so we're going to be looking at, at um, gene-based um, association tests. Um, and also this Go analysis to see if we can get more leverage on what parts of the genome um, might be driving this association between homophily on genotypes and natural selection. So let me just close by saying um, there's been a lot of uh, excitement in the last uh, few years about um, the fact that our guts are full of these critters that have genes too and that that might be influencing a lot of our behavior. Um, and this, there's been this idea that, that this, the metagenome is actually an important part of our history. Um, what I really want to challenge the whole community to think about is that not only is it the case that we are metagenomic from within, we are metagenomic from without. We are living in a sea of the genes of other people. Those genes lead to phenotypes that have consequences for our behavior and our outcomes. And this has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. And I think it's, it's going to be really important for us to think about how to link up the human social network with these networks that are going on at the molecular level to try to better understand and get better resolution on what these associations are and how they might be affecting outcomes that we care about. So with that, I just want to thank my social network and thank you guys for inviting me to talk.
tried to find them, and they're hard to find because I think the, the average effect is copying and adopt, adapting the system wrong. But depending on tied these averages, I think a personality trait to an individual will cause some people to be more likely to do the opposite of, of, of what other people do. And so what this means is that among those people that are conformists, those numbers are going to be even higher, which is crazy enough because the non-conformists are sort of they're, 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 they're bringing down the, the, the whole average. Um, we have tried to look at things like, for example, um, if your if your partner um, gets lung cancer, uh, does that cause you to be more likely to quit smoking? Right. So, but even there, um, there's not really enough of an effect size to, to detect in the, the sample size that you have. Now, it's, it's a rare event, so it's 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 hard to detect in a, in a sample of like five or ten thousand people who have it and they're bringing a heart stuff, uh, which is why I'm really excited about these two new data sets that come down the line. We will have hundreds of thousands and a million people massive uh, host on and help data, and you'll be able to answer questions. So this is, this is really the big thing. The next big thing is, okay, you've kind of shown us already that you get these positive effects in these networks. Now, how do we figure out the variance? How do we figure out, you know, who is it that's doing the most copying? Who is it that's doing the most copying? Yeah, so um, in our evolutionary model on homophily, there was a, a pronouncedly strong preference for homophily across a wide variety of the parameters that we looked at. Um, but we were probably enforcing um, characteristics in a uniform way in that model. Like if you allowed kids to be more um, discriminant to different kinds of things, you might get sort of, you can imagine like a bouncing selection story where where there are opportunities for you to do the different things. Cases where you know 